Okay, so we have today, December 3rd, uh, goal is to finish up chapter 10, 11, maybe start on chapter 12, I don't know, we'll see. Um, and then you can see that we're talking about chapter 12 and 20 on Wednesday, and then trying to prep for the final exam, which will be a week from Wednesday. And so I'm going to have to give up chapter 20. There's just no way that I should have chapter 20 on the exam. It's just not going to be right. It's cramming too much. So what I will do is I will record a lecture for chapter 20. I'll put the slides, the lecture, the quiz, and everything up for 20. Um, and I'll go through that and discuss that on Camtasia and post it up on Canvas, but it will not be uh, on the midterm, so uh, that you get the coverage of that material, but you don't are responsible for being tested on it. Um, when I put up the information for Chapter 20, I'm going to be looking back at what we had already said about accounting changes, because we really did cover that stuff. You know, I think it was Chapter 4, we talked about how to handle change in accounting estimate, change in accounting principle, that sort of thing cumulative effect of accounting change. That's really the subject of Chapter 20, and I probably should have not done it then and did it uh, for this chapter. So I'll see to what extent there's a couple additional things from Chapter 20 I may want to cover. I'll put those on the uh, slides and stuff in Canvas, but it will not be on your midterm. So the midterm, I mean final, your third midterm. It's like a third midterm, yeah, final. So it's going to be Chapter, what, 10 through 12? No, 20. Chapter 10 through 12, no 20. Okay, well, you will not have Chapter 20 on your final. Unless, you know, somebody wants to object and say, no, I insist that we have Chapter 20, which I don't think that's going to happen. Okay, so uh, we're going to go ahead and not have Chapter 20, although I will put up material for that. Okay, so that uh, that is covered. But I think we actually already covered that back in that other chapter. Any question on that? Okay, now a uh, couple of... Students had asked for uh, extra credit opportunity, okay, so um, I have decided to go ahead and do that. Uh, I'm going to offer 10 points of extra credit for what I call career development project, okay. Career development project is basically something where you will be um, uh, doing sort of a forward-looking resume, and this forward-looking resume will involve talking about what your career objectives are. Um, I'll give you, what does it say, five points? I'll give you ten points. Okay, let me open that. I'll give you ten points for this, not five. Unless you only want five. Ten's okay? Okay, so I'll give you 10 points for that instead of 5, okay, 10 points for that. And um, basically, you're going to have to talk about what your objective is, sort of like your mission statement, education, and like I said, it could be forward-looking. If you were doing a real resume, you'd put whatever education levels you had achieved. For this, you would talk about what level of education you plan to achieve, bachelor's, master's, PhD, whatever. What professional certifications do you plan to get? For CPAs in this class, I'm thinking, for accounting majors in this class, I'm thinking CPA, but uh, that's all I have to say about that. Okay. Uh, professional associations. Do you plan to belong to the American Institute of Certified Public Accountants, um, some other organization, etc.? cetera? Uh, what ethical behavior do you think is important now? In other words, do you think it would be wise at this point to, uh, you know, be involved in sort of some financial fraud and be convicted of that? No, absolutely not. I mean, that's something that's going to prohibit you from becoming a CPA. So you think through all of these things. You should take up about a page to do this. Uh, if you do a good page of this stuff, write it from the heart. I'll give you 10 points extra credit on it, okay? Now, it needs to be turned in by December 20th and you will submit it through Canvas. So what you will do, can I close this? Okay. What you will do, you know, you guys are looking at me like somehow I'm like burdening you with this. If you don't want to do it, you don't have to do it. 
So everybody's like, oh, now i got to do that. No, you don't. Okay, if you don't want it, don't do it. Don't get the 10 points. won't hurt me none. Okay, now um, when you get into Canvas, you go to Assignments. And in Assignments, you will see that Career Development Project there. Okay, and you'll click on that. And when you go to submit that, oh, I'm in teacher mode. Let me get out of, let me go to student view. And you go to assignments. And you go to this career development project and you click on that. And you see how it says submit assignment. So you'll click on submit assignment and then you see how it's going to let you attach the word file that's going to be the thing that I'm asking you to prepare, the one pager. And then you hit submit and I'll be able to see it there and I will grade it. It's due uh, December 20th, so it's after our final. Okay, But you need to get it into me by around then because uh, I need to go to grades and I need to see if you turned it in or not. And I don't want to be sitting there on Christmas Eve putting your grades into the system. Okay. All right. Question? Yes, sir. Uh, case study, uh, page long or so. Yeah, you don't have to go much more than that, I don't think. You can go past a page, but you don't have to go more than a page. I mean, you don't have to go past. You don't have to go past the page. You could, uh, you could single space it. Come on, guys, just do the thing. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. I don't care. Okay. Just don't hand me a twig. You know, don't hand me a napkin that says, "Here you go." Here's a picture of what I wrote on the back of the napkin while I was hung over. You know. Um, you know, make it something decent. Okay. All right. Any question? Concerns? Okay, guys, let's get rocking because we got to finish this chapter uh, 11 stuff today so that we got a decent shot at getting through chapter 12, okay? And then again, as I've stated here now, chapter 20, will I'll give you the material for it and I'll do a lecture on it for you, but we're not going to test it, okay? So that we don't, um, so that we don't uh, get it, we, you know, whatever, okay? All right, intangible assets. Okay, now what is an intangible? Why do they call it intangible assets? Well, tangible assets, now finishing up chapter 10, 11, talking about assets. Tangible assets are things like property, plant, and equipment. Something that you can, what, sink your teeth into, right? A piece of land, a building. You look at it, you see the brick and mortar, you understand its value, okay? An intangible asset is something that is not readily determinable that it's going to have value just by looking at it, for example. A patent is an intangible asset, and all it is is a piece of paper that gives you the what the legal unique opportunity to say develop a certain type of product. For example, let's say that I came up with some sort of uh, device, like uh, say I, this is a little cell phone, and all you have to do is take that little chip out of there, plug it into your brain, and you can control it with your thoughts at that point. Well, that could be something that could be very valuable, right? Maybe in the future. And if I develop that, I have the rights to that. I have the what? I have the patent to that. Okay? So that could potentially be recorded as an asset for a company. Okay? Now, in order for me to record that as an asset on my balance sheet, an intangible asset, it has to be acquired from another party in order to be recorded at its cost. Okay? It has to be acquired from a third party. If I am spending the money to develop that intangible asset, the cost of developing the intangible asset not acquired from others should be expensed when incurred. Okay? So what happens? We're sitting here and we're trying to develop this patent for this thing that you stick the chip in your head and it will read your thoughts and that's how it will work. Do you think that's going to pan out? You think that research is going to work? Sounds pretty far-fetched, doesn't it? 
Okay. Most research is like that. Most research is somebody's idea of what they think they could develop, but most of the time, what a research project fails. And so, okay. So FASB tells us, U.S. GAAP tells us that we have to expense the cost of developing an intangible asset like this little cell phone chip device that I'm talking about. Now, let's say I'm doing that research, I finish that research, and then you come along and you say, wow, that looks like it's really viable, like we're actually going to be able to produce that product. And let's say I'm not the management guy, I'm not the production guy. So you buy that patent from me. Well, now you have done what? You have assigned value to that, and so you will be able to record it on your balance sheet at whatever you paid for me for it, okay? So in order to be an asset, it has to be what? Acquired from a third party. Any money you spend to develop that, that, that asset, that intangible asset, that patent is what? Expensed. It's all going to be expensed. Okay, so we say that, but then, of course, there's always what? There's always small exceptions to that rule of expensing the cost of developing an intangible. And one of the classic examples here is if you have legal fees that you paid in, um, in uh, defending your right to that patent, registration costs, design costs, other costs to secure the asset, then yes, even though you had uh, expensed the money to develop it, you start getting to a point where you're simply doing what? Simply paying legal fees to defend your right to the patent, etc. Then you could capitalize those. Okay? So any money that you spend to develop internally is expensed except what? These greens down here. The what? The only time you can put the cost on there is if you have done what? Acquired that from a third party. Okay? Okay, good. So that's how our intangible assets generally work. And um, you come over and we say that uh, the, the economic value of intangible asset does not last forever, just like uh, very few la assets last forever. I guess land does. Okay, but for the most part, no asset lasts forever, so we will amortize the value of that patent using straight lines. So it's like depreciation. You take whatever the estimated life of that is, you divide it into whatever the cost is, that gives you your annual amortization is what they call it instead of depreciation. So you depreciate it just like any other asset. Okay? All right, good. Come over and... The key point here is startup costs are expensed, okay? Anything you spend on startup costs, they're expensed. So you're noticing a little bit of a theme here in U.S. GAAP, in which U.S. GAAP is saying any money you're spending to develop an intangible asset, to start up your business where we don't know if it's going to turn out or not, rule of conservatism says what? Expense the cost of that, right? Okay, good. Let's go ahead and let's take a look at research and development costs, which we've really already kind of said that as it relates to patents. But let's just go ahead and look at it here. Under U.S. GAAP, research and development costs are what? Expensed. However, there are a couple of exceptions to the rule of expensing research and development. Again, the concern here, guys, under U.S. GAAP is that if you go and you start to capitalize research and development and you're showing all these assets and then investors come along and say, wow, look at this company's increasing its assets. It's showing this great income. It's not expensing all these costs. Let's invest. And then what happens to the... Um, project, it flops. It doesn't, they don't get, in fact, there's a case right now uh, where a Congress member got in trouble because they were doing some research on a pill or something, and then they didn't get the FDA approval, and when they didn't get the FDA approval, Food and Drug Administration approval, the stock was ready to drop, and the Congress member got wind that it hadn't passed its FDA approval, and they shared insider information and went and sold their stock Okay, in anticipation of this. What was ridiculous is that person then was indicted for doing that, and they're up on charges for having done that. They got reelected. So go see how the public works while they're up on an indictment in this thing. 
thing. And it sounds like the SEC's got them dead to rights. They were reelected by their particular you know, voters. So I don't get what voters are doing these days. But anyway, that's all the side. You need to expense these research and development costs because you don't know what's going to happen. You don't know if you're getting the FDA approval or not, right? Now, there are two exceptions to that general rule, which is if you have investment in equipment, et cetera, that's going to have an alternative useful life outside of the research and development, then you can capitalize it. You'll take the depreciation. The depreciation depreciation will be part of the research and development line item on the income statement, but you don't expense the whole cost of that building, let's say, because after the research and development's over, you're going to use it as a warehouse or something like that, okay? The other exception is that if there's a contractual arrangement with somebody to buy that research and development off of you. So what happens? A company comes to me and says, John, I want you to research a pill, pill that will cure baldness or something, okay? And I say, sure, okay, you know, I'll go ahead and research that as long as you agree to buy the research from me after I'm done with it, regardless of the outcome. And you say yes, well, what happens? That means that I'm going to get that money back, right, which means it has future economic benefit, so I could capitalize costs like that. So those are our two exceptions. Now, ultimately, the person that purchases that research and develop from, from me, the company, whatever, that company will expense the cost of whatever it is they paid me for that research and development. So ultimately, that research and development expense does hit what? an expense account on somebody's income statement, it doesn't have to be the researcher if another party has agreed to buy that research. So whoever buys it, they don't capitalize it as an asset that they bought. They'll debit expense and credit cash when they pay me for it, right? Okay. Okay, good. Now you come over and you take a look at items not considered research and development, okay? And uh, marketing is not research. If you're marketing something, that means you have a viable product, don't you? So that is not research. It's an expense, but it's not research and development expense, right? Quality control testing. That means you have a good crop product and you're just to make sure that the quality is being maintained or you're trying to enhance that quality of a viable product. That is, again, expense, but it is not what? It is not research and development expense. And I have no idea, idea of what reformation of a chemical compound is, whatever. I guess it's not research, though. Okay? Okay, good. Now, something interesting about IFRS. International financial reporting standards say this. You can capitalize the development. You only have to expense the research, so stated the other way. Research is expense, just like U.S. GAAP. Development, they let you capitalize. Now, uh, the, you say, well, why doesn't U.S. GAAP get around to that? Remember, guys, a lot of what we do in our financial reporting is tied to the Great Depression, the collapse of the stock markets, and we don't want to go down there again. And what was happening is a lot of companies were capitalizing things of assets that they shouldn't have been. There was just bogus research and that sort of stuff. Investors were harmed, and so U.S. GAAP doesn't want to let that go. And so they hang on to expense the research and development. IFRS, they're not quite as uh, scary about that. And so they say, hey, yes, expense the research, but the development you can capitalize. Okay. Okay, good. Which do you like better, IFRS or U.S. GAAP? Good. Conservatives. Okay. Conservative way of doing it. Most conservative, right? Okay. All right, good. Now, let's talk about software development costs. What happens here? Um, software development cost is sort of a carve out of the rule that we will do what? That we will expense all research and development. So for software, they come up with a different rule and they say, look, yes, just like we do for all research and development, expense up to the technological feasibility phase. After you have reached technological feasibility, then you will go ahead and do what? Capitalize any cost after technological feasibility. Now, guys, I'm not going to sit there and say, okay, what constitutes technological feasibility? 
I mean, if you end up working for a software company, I'm sure you'll know plenty of that. You get plenty of training on that. The key phrase here is what? Technological feasibility. Expense until te technological feasibility is achieved and then do what? Capitalize after technological feasibility. I will hold you accountable to that phrase, but I don't expect you to know what particular activities constitute that. Okay? Okay, good. Now, once I have capitalized my software development cost, I must amortize it, and I will amortize it over which method gives me the greater of my um, amortization. I'll take the total capitalized cost, and I can either amortize as a percentage of revenue, which will take the gross revenue for the period divided by the total projected revenue, or the straight line, whichever gives me the greater amortization. Okay, so just to use some easy numbers here, let's say I think that my total projected revenue for this software is four million dollars, and let's say my current gross revenue is one million. What percentage is that? Not a trick question. 25%, 0.25, good, 25%. If the amount I had capitalized was, say, 100,000, and again, I'm just making these easy numbers, 100,000 times 0.25 means my amortization will be 25,000. But I have to look to see if straight line gives me a bigger number. And so straight line, let's say, and this is long life for software, so bear with me. I just want the numbers to be easy. Let's say it has a 10-year economic life, which I don't think any software does. So that would give me what? 0 0.10. And if I multiply that by the 100,000, that's going to only give me amortization of what? 10,000. So which one would I pick? The percentage of revenue, right? And by the way, guys, that toggles back and forth year to year depending on which one's bigger. So next year, it could be that the straight line gives me the bigger amortization. I would take that in that next year. So you go year to year to see what gives you what? The greater amortization between these two methods. Okay? Okay, good. Come over, and uh, you got this little graph here. Oh, um, which shows you what after technological feasibility you should capitalize if you're waiting for deeper meaning from that graph stop okay that's all it's trying to give you there that's all I want you to take away from that of course we will do what the cost that we capitalize if we're a software company that cost that we capitalize is going to be what part of our inventory and we will carry it at the lower cost or market so we go back to that whole discussion that we had with our lower cost or market discussion. Okay, so we capitalize the cost, but if the market value falls below cost, then we're going to do what? Then we're going to use that market value. Okay. Okay, good. Now you come over and we talk about uh, software that we are developing not for sale, but for internal use okay so we're developing a software that we're just going to use inside of our company and so what happens there we will expense costs during the preliminary project state so we have replaced the phrase technological feasibility now with what preliminary project state and we will capitalize cost incurred after the preliminary project state so we just replaced the word technological feasibility with what preliminary project state for internal use okay now any costs that we have capitalized where we are um, developing that software for internal use the what capitalized costs are going to be amortized and notice we don't have the option of uh, percent of sales because we're not selling it right and so we would just use straight line okay now this down here that I kind of stole from some other materials. Not the best written thing ever, but let me be basically summarize what this is saying. Let's say I've capitalized this software for internal use and my door is being beaten down by people who want to buy that software from me. And I finally give in, I say, okay, I'm going to sell it for external use. What happens? When I sell it to that third party, the difference between the book value and whatever I sell it for is going to be a gain or loss, isn't it? 
it will be a gain or loss. If I sell it for more than book value gain, less than its book value, it will be a loss. Okay. Okay, good. Come over. And uh, IFRS does not have a special rule for research and development. Okay. Uh, I mean, not research and development, but for software development. They point back to their general rule, which is what? Capitalize the development expense the research right and you're a big company you know what capital what constitutes research versus what capital what, what constitutes what development you decide what to capitalize and what to expense okay so this is why and I'm sh most mostly showing this to you so that you can be the uh, the 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 uh, articulate one in the conversation because most people will sit there and say, well, IFRS is more principles based and U.S. GAAP is more rules based. And you ask them, for example, what? What does that mean? And they'll sit there and they'll go, well, it means that IFRS is more principles based and U.S. GAAP is more rules based. That's what it means. Yeah, but what? what, what, what? They never have an example. Okay. Okay. And so the example is research development. You can say, well, software development. Software development, what? First, U.S. GAAP tells us expense the research and development, but then they start getting into nitty-gritty rules about, but if it's software, then do this, and if it's for internal use, do that. Whereas IFRS just backs off and says, we've shown you the principle of what we want you to do. We're not going to start slicing it up into 50 different rules for different situations. Okay? All right. So that's kind of a good example of what they mean by that. All right. Good. Now you come over and uh, let's talk about impairment of our assets. What happens? Rule of conservatism says that if an asset's fair value has fallen below its carrying value, you have to write it down to that lower. Let me say that again because I think I went too fast and I missed my off ramp. Let me start again. U.S. GAAP rule of conservatism says what? That if an asset's market value has fallen below its book value, you have to write it down to the lower market value. Okay? And what we're going to talk about here is how for our fixed assets, our property, plant, and equipment, we will determine what that potential write-down should be. Okay? So they tell us that it is a two-step method here where we test for impairment okay and under that two-step method we will look at the carrying amount of the asset compared to the sum of undiscounted cash flows so we start out not discounting the cash flows at all so if it's going to take us a thousand years to get the cash flows out of this thing then we'll look a thousand years in the future to see what the cash flows are supposed to be undiscounted Okay. Now, we will then compare the book value, the carrying amount, to the undiscounted cash flows. Undiscounted cash flows. Let's make sure we understand that those cash flows are what? Undiscounted. Okay. And if we're in a situation where the carrying value is less or the future cash flows are more than the carrying value, then there is no impairance to that asset. We will not have to write it down. If the undiscounted cash flows are less than the carrying value, now we will have impairment and we will have to determine what that impairment is. And I'm going to show you how to do that here on the next uh, slides, but we will basically start to discount the cash flows. So here we have an asset with a net carrying value of 900000 the net future cash flows undiscounted are a million, so we're going to recover our carrying value, aren't we? Since that's the case, there is no impairment. We stop. We do not have to write that asset down. Okay. Now, you come over and you take a look at the next page. And the carrying value is $1.2 million. Net future cash flows are a, a million now. So we're not going to recover our costs, are we? Okay. So now we have to do what? We have to determine the present value of these future cash flows now. So now we use present value, and they're 700000 Obviously, they're less than the undiscounted, aren't they? 
Okay, so what happens when we calculate the impairment? We compare the seven hundred thousand, the discounted cash flows, versus the assets carrying value, which is one point two. We have a loss of five hundred thousand, don't we? So we'll debit loss, report that on the income statement as a non-operating loss. We'll credit the asset for five hundred thousand dollars to write it down, right? So we write it down. We will then depreciate the new remaining cost, which is seven hundred thousand. So we would take seven hundred thousand. Let's say it had a I don't know ten year life. We would divide the seven hundred thousand by ten years, and our depreciation going forward would be seventy thousand a year, right? Once it is written down, it stays down. Restoration is not permitted. It stays down. Okay. Now, in assumption two, they sat there and they said, well, what if you're planning to dispose of the asset? Well, if we're planning to dispose of the asset, then we will have to also consider any cost of disposal in calculating our loss. So our loss will be what? Will be the 700,000 versus the 1.2, 500,000, but then we'll have to consider the cost of disposal as part of our total loss. Our total loss. So now the loss is 600,000. We'll debit loss. We'll credit assets. 600,000. We'll write it down. We no longer depreciate that asset because we are disposing of it, and we're not going to be sitting there exuding any more future economic benefits, so we won't depreciate it. And restoration is permitted. Restoration meaning what? I can write it back up to the what? To the 700,000, um, I mean, excuse me, the uh, 1.2 million uh, carrying value, but I cannot write it back up above 1.2 million. I can't keep writing it up and up, you know, above 1.2, right? Okay. Question? Okay, good. That sort of summarizes what we said on the last couple of slides. Question. Impairment loss, guys, is going to be part of income from continuing operations, but it is a what? Non-operating item. Okay. Unless the impairment is associated with what? A discontinued operation. If the impairment is associated with a discontinued operation, then it's down in discontinued operations, right? Okay, so I'm going to get rid of a whole segment. Now I look at the assets in that segment and I feel I have to write those assets down. Then obviously that impairment loss is part of the I and lid, loss from operation, impairment loss. But if it's just a piece of equipment and I'm not disposing of an entire segment, then the impairment on that particular asset, let's say, is going to be part of my continuing operations, but it'll be what? A non-operating item, right? Okay. Question? Okay, good. That gets us through those slides because I want to absolutely get into the quiz, see if we can actually maybe get the quiz done before we're out of here and maybe start to jump in. Are you saying the markup? Should you take it to the Yes, I will. Thank you for reminding. Save as. Oh, it's already. Uh, I had already called it markup, so this will save the new stuff. Okay, good. And I'll just replace this one with the one that's already up there so that it goes through to the end. All right. Quiz time. Okay, so we've got this, uh, any question? Okay, so we got this Sam Corp, and they purchased a plot of land of 100000 Cost to raise a building, that means tear down a building, not raise a building, but raise a building, tear it down, okay? Uh, you have a building on the property amounted to 50000 Sam received 10000 from the sale of scrap materials. Sam built a new plant on the site at a total cost of 800000 including excavation costs. Excavation costs is digging the hole for the foundation. 
for the building, okay, uh, of 30,000. What amount should we include as the land? And remember, we said cost of land is anything you have to do to get ready for its intended use, right? Get it nice and flat so you can start building on it. So how about the cost of the plot of the land? Yes. Got to pick that up. How about the cost to raise that old building? Yes. Yeah, we had to get it nice and flat, so we had to take that old junky building off of there. What do you want to do with the 10,000 scrap when we sold this thing for scrap? Huh? I'm sorry? Subtract. Oh, okay. I thought you guys were saying give it back. I was like, what do you mean give it back? Subtract it, right? 10,000. Okay, good. How about what we paid for the new building? How about the excavation cost? Good. Part of the building. Anything you got to do to get that thing ready so you can put that foundation in and stuff is part of the cost of the building, right? Okay, good. So when we add all that up or net that all out, we get what, 140,000? Do you want questions like that on your midterm? Do you want questions like that on your CPA exam? Yes. Okay. So the CPA exam, not too hard, is it? Okay. Number two, theoretically, which of the following costs incurred in connection with a machine purchase for use in a company's manufacturing operations would be capitalized? Put on the balance sheet any cost that you incur to secure that asset so you can use it productively in your business part of the cost of that asset, isn't it? Okay, so how about insurance? Yes. Well, in transit. Yes, that's part of the cost of that, right, to get it there safely. How about testing for preparation of machine for use? Yes, yes both of those, right? You can't start using the machine and have, you know, a piston fly out of it and hit somebody in the head, right? So that's all part of the cost of getting that machine ready for its use. Okay. All right, great. Number three, coal company began constructing a building for its own use in January. During the year, coal incurred interest of 50000 on specific construction debt and 20000 on other borrowings. Interest computed on the weighted average amount of accumulated expenditures for the year was 40000 what amount of the interest cost should be capitalized? This is a purely definitional question, guys. This is not computational. Even though it has a number in it, it is definitional. It is not computational. And when we talked about construction period interest, we said that you capitalize interest on what? On the weighted average of accumulated expenditures. So any interest that's associated with the accumulated uh, weighted average of accumulated expenditures is going to be capitalized, right? So what's the answer? 40,000. Good. That was a definitional question, right? You got to pick up that weighted average of accumulated expenditures, apply an interest rate to it, right? Okay. Now you come over and you take a look at this uh, next question. And uh, Mary Company purchased a machine costing 125,000 for its manufacturing operations and paid shipping cost of 20. Mary spent an additional 10,000 testing and preparing the machine for use. What should we record as the cost of the machine? Everything in this question <laughs> is the answer. The 125 plus what? Plus the 20 plus the testing 10. January 5th, year three, Starlight Construction Company began construction for project qualifying for capitalization of interest. The total amount spent on the project during the year was 250000 spent uniformly throughout the year. To help pay for the construction, 200000 was borrowed at a 10% interest rate on January 1st, year three, and funds not needed for construction were temporarily invested in short-term securities, yielding 3000 in interest revenue. Other than construction funds borrowed, the only other debt outstanding during the year was 150000 10-year, 7% note payable, dated January 1st. How much interest should be capitalized? What are the rules? We have to pick up the weighted average of accumulated expenditures, don't we? We have to use the interest rate on the specific borrowing for the project, don't we? If our weighted average of accumulated expenditures exceed the 
um, specific borrowing. Then we have to use the average borrowing for all other borrowings of the company. We cannot what? We cannot capitalize more than our actual interest expense for the period. And what? If we have a investment of any idle funds, the interest that's pulled off of that is not netted against. Weren't those the rules that we went through? Okay. So can we calculate the weighted average of accumulated expenditures here? Well, if they tell me we spent what? 250000 and we spent it evenly throughout the year. That's like saying that we spent what? So much per month. Okay, 250,000 divided by 12. Okay, but what happens? There's 12 months in a year, and if we spend it evenly, then the average of 12 months over the course of the year is six months, isn't it? You have a what, 12 month year, the average month is June. Okay, so if you would sit there and say, okay, well, I'm going to divide it by 12, but I'm going to multiply it by six, that's the same as doing what? Dividing it by 2 to get the average accumulated expenditures for the period. If your expenditures occur evenly throughout the year. So that means my weighted average accumulated expenditures is what? 125,000. Right? 12 months in a year. Divide it by 12. But to get the average, you have to multiply it by what? By 6 is the average month. Average months in a year. Right? Okay. So that gives me what? 125,000 weighted average of accumulated expenditure. Guys, don't make me do it like this. I'm not going to do 1 12th times, you know, times uh, 250,000 divided by 12. 2 12th times 150, times 250,000 um, times 250,000 divided by 12. 3 12 times 250,000 divided by 12. 4 12 times 250,000 uh, divided by 12. That's going to make it a 6 12 average, isn't it? Okay, so you divide it by 2. That gives me the 125,000. And then I sit there and I multiply that by what? 10% because it does not exceed, and I don't have to worry about any of these other interest rates because I don't exceed the specific new borrowing. So 12,500. Now I can eyeball this and know that my actual interest expense is what? More than this, isn't it? It's 20,000 plus these others. Okay, so I know that you know I'm not going to capitalize too much interest because my actual interest is more than the amount applying the interest rate to the specific uh, spe the interest rate from the specific borrowing to the weighted average of accumulated expenditures. I don't net it off this 3,000. That was the other rule. So the answer here is what? Should I subtract the 3,000? So what's the answer? 12,500. Right? Okay. Okay, good. Come over and question. Okay, so you're telling me that what you want to do, because the other way that we would do it is. Um, is take 12,000, what was it, um, 250,000, and divide that by 12, and that gives me what, 20,833 and 33,000, okay, good, and so you want to take 20,833, 3.33 and you want to multiply that by it would be outstanding for 1 12th of the year 
okay, whatever that comes out to. And then you want to sit there and you want to take 40,833.33, and you or that would be outstanding for 12 twelfths. You want to multiply that one by 11 twelfths. We assume that every month has 30 days. Oh, sorry, yeah, 30 days. yeah, we would say that every month. month. So the first expenditure is assumed to happen on, on, I guess, the 15th. Okay, if you want to say it's average. Okay, but we're saying the average, you know, expenditures is basically I'm just going by month, how much per month, and then you'd have to add 20,000. You'd multiply that times 10 twelfths, and you multiply all that. And after you get done doing all that, do that at home when you're bored. And I'm going to tell you that that's going to come out to a six twelfths of 250,000. Because that last one's going to be what? Multiplied by one twelfth versus the other one was 12 twelfths. Okay? So by the time you do all that, you're going to get what? You're going to get 250,000 divided by 6, uh, divided by 2, or multiplied times 6 twelfths. Okay? Okay. If it was, you know, some other situation where they didn't tell you it occurred evenly throughout the year, and they told you, well, they had spent this much up to this date, then they spent a little bit more, a little bit more, it, was, it would be back the way we did it when we talked about it in the textbook. Okay? Okay, I can't sit here and teach, you know, out, you know, arithmetic. Okay, all right, number six. All right, we're dealing with Spiro Corp uses the sum of years digits method to depreciate equipment. Purchased January 1st, 1996 for 20000 Estimated salvage value of the equipment is 2000 Estimated useful life is four years. And we say, what should Spiro report as the assets carrying them out at December 31st, 1998, okay? So we're going to go ahead and get our depreciable base. And in year one, we would take what? The sum of the year's digits, what do they say? Four year life, one plus two plus three plus four equals what? 10, that's the base. And we would take what? Four tenths the first year. So we take 7,200 in year two. We take what? Three tenths the second year. Okay. Now this particular question asked me what is it at the end of what? End of 1998. So I need to go into that third year. It's 3,600. So the accumulated depreciation is going to be 72, uh, 20,000 purchase price minus what? 72 plus 54 plus 36. Right. That gives me the carrying value. What uh, what did you cut off the carrying value here? So what's the answer? C. Thirty-eight hundred. Okay. Okay. Good. Come over. Let's take a look at number. Oh, this is telling me the answer is C. I don't see that we got much mileage out of that. Is that the same question? No. Oh, I see. Okay. This is going to be a depletion question. Okay. And so we purchased a mine for two million. And cost to prepare the mine for coal extraction is five hundred thousand. I'm going to add that, right? Okay. It was estimated that. St uh, it was estimated that 750,000 tons would be extracted from the mine during its useful life. Clanter, Clanter, uh, Cantor planned to sell the property for 100,000 at the end of its useful life. So what am I going to do with that? Good. I'm going to subtract that 100,000 at the end. And when I subtract that 100,000, that gives me a depreciable base of what? 2,400,000? And then I simply divide that by the 15,000 tons. So how much per ton? Oh, I'm sorry, not 15,000 tons, what? 
that was the current year's amount. The total tonnage, right, not just the one year's, is 750,000. Gives me how much per ton? 3.2. Okay. Okay, good. Number eight. During the current year, we incurred the following costs. Are any of these research and development expense? Should research and development performances performed by key be research and development expense? Hello? Okay. Construction and testing of production prototypes? Yes, production prototypes mean you have not finished that product yet, right? Okay. Uh, when we said quality control testing, testing prototypes is not quality control testing. That prototype means you don't have a product yet, right? You still working on it? Testing in search of new products. All of this is research and development, isn't it? Okay. So anytime it sounds like they're doing something new here, that's going to be research and development. And all of that is what? Expensed. Okay. Um, during the year, we incurred $400,000 of research and development costs in a laboratory to develop a product for which a patent was granted on July 1st, year one. Then we had legal fees and other costs associated with the patent of 82000 Estimated economic life is 10 years. What amount should we capitalize? How about the 400000 What? Research and development cost to develop a product for which a patent was granted in January is expensed, isn't it? How about the legal fees? Huh? Legal fees we capitalize, right? Okay, so what's the answer here? 82000 Anything you do to develop that patent is expensed. Once you have developed that patent, if you start incurring legal fees to defend your right to that patent, to register the thing, etc., then you can start capitalizing. Never. Oh, the exceptions? Uh, exception, sorry. Exception is if the thing that I'm developing has an alternative useful life outside of the research. So if I buy a building and I'm going to use it for research, and then I say, yeah, but the research is only going to go on for three years, and after the three years, I'm going to turn it into a warehouse, then you would go and the building has a... 20 year life, then I would go ahead and I would depreciate the building over 20 years. The depreciation expense on that is research and development, but I don't expense the entire building. Okay? Um, and the other exception was if somebody is going to purchase that research and development bought from me under a contract. Can't be that they said, oh, yeah, you know, at the bar one day, any research you do, I'll pay for it. You know, there has to be a contract somewhere where they've said, okay, yeah, we'll uh, pay for the research. And then they're going to pay for it so I can capitalize the cost. It's sort of like building up inventory, isn't it? And then when they buy the thing, I'll debit my cost gets sold. I'll credit that asset. They will credit their cash, obviously, and debit the expense. So it hits an expense on the purchaser's financial statements, not on the uh, seller's. The seller, of course, will take a cost of goods sold, and I'll assume there'll be some sort of sales price, some sort of profit built into that, in which we would debit the uh, cash and credit the sales, right? And that would be what? Single performance obligation, I guess, in that case. Okay. Okay. Standard company spent ten thousand on a new software package. 
that it you that is to be used only for internal use. The amount spent is for cost after the preliminary project stage. Should we capitalize that? After preliminary project state? We should capitalize that, shouldn't we? Huh? Okay. Okay, good. The economic life is expected to be three years. The equipment, uh, the equipment on which the package is to be used is being depreciated over five years. Okay, I don't care. That's like the computer equipment that they're going to use the software on. I don't know why they have to throw that nonsense in there. That's going to be on its own depreciation schedule, isn't it? Okay, but we're going to amortize the software separately. What amount of expense should standard report on its income statement? Well, we know we're going to capitalize, what, $10 million, aren't we? And they tell us that the software has, what, three-year life, so we're supposed to use straight line on that, $3,333.33. Okay, good. Now, a couple things. We're going to go through these questions. Did everybody sign in? Did I say, did I say, did I say that in order to be eligible for the extra credit, you have to be, have to have, to have been here every class since the midterm? Okay, I'm saying it now. Okay. This extra credit is for people that are making a good faith effort to do well in this class by coming to class. So if somebody's just blowing off the class, they're not picking up their midterm, they're just letting me hold their midterm and all that kind of nonsense, then, you know, I'm not going to entertain that. So make sure you're signing in. Okay? Now. <clears throat> do -do -do -do. Okay? I'm telling you right now. I'm going to go through these multiple choice questions with you here, but I'm also going to show you the journal entries that would go along with what's being contemplated in this fact pattern. This sort of thing will be how your free response question will go. I will sit there and I will give you the fact pattern and I'll ask you for the journal entries that I'm going to show you that will go along with a fact pattern like this. Do 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 do. Okay? All right. Okay, so let's go ahead and let's take a look at this one here. And we've got this uh, January 1st failed trade, traded a delivery truck and paid 10000 cash for a tow truck owned by Baker. The delivery truck had an original cost of 140000 accumulated depreciation of eighty. An estimated fair value of 90. Feld estimated the fair value of Baker's tow truck to be 100,000. The transaction had commercial substance. If the transaction has commercial substance, will we take the gain? The transaction has commercial substance, will we take the gain? If the transaction has commercial substance, will we take the gain? And that's the minimum thing you should have got out of that discussion. If the transaction has commercial substance, we take the gains. If it doesn't have commercial substance, we will have the rules about, well, was there boot involved and all that sort of thing, right? Okay? Okay, good. So we know we're going to take the gain. So they say what amount of gain should be recognized by Feld here. Okay? So... Um, how will we do the gain here? How do you calculate gain? You calculate gain fair value minus, don't look it up. Come on, guys. Gain is whatever the fair value of something is minus what? Minus its book value, right? You don't have to look that up. Okay, so the fair value here is what? Estimated fair value is what? 90000 for the delivery truck. We're doing it for Feld, right? They're the ones that have the delivery truck. Is 90000 What's the book value? 
140,000 of the original cost minus the accumulated depreciation of 80,000. So what's that give me? 60,000. 60,000 minus the, um, not, you know, 90,000 minus the 60,000 gives me a $30,000 gain. Should I take all of that gain? Yes, I should because the transaction has commercial substance, right? So the answer here is what? 30,000. Okay, but what I'm going to do over here is I'm going to now give you the journal entry that Feld would make. For this transaction right okay so since they're getting rid of the equipment and the equipment had original cost of 140 I'm going to credit the equipment what is it uh, truck whatever for 140 right that's getting rid of the equipment I have to get rid of the accumulated depreciation don't I so I debit the accumulated depreciation for 80,000 to get rid of it I know that I have this gain that I just calculated of what? 30,000. By the way, guys, I'm going in the order as to how you would put together this journal entry on your final so that you don't mess up, right? Go for the easy thing. So the third thing is the gain that I would have calculated the way I just showed you, right? Okay. So now what? Now I have to bring on the new truck don't I now what I get annoyed with this software that I'm using to give you some of the material that we're looking at is they keep calling that number a plug and I guess you could plug it if what you wanted to we've got 170 um, sitting here um, as oh they paid some cash too didn't they sorry they also paid cash so I guess cash would be uh, your number three credit here because they did pay some cash and then four would be the gain that you just calculated okay so the amount that you bring in for the truck you could call it a plug of 180 to make this journal entry balance right okay but I don't like to do it that way I don't like to do plugs plugs mean that every time I look at a question like this I have to make the whole journal entry if I just ask you what's the amount of the um, new truck that's going to come on you have to go through a whole set of journal entries to answer it don't you there's an easier way to answer it remember I said it's the book value of the assets that were given up plus the gain isn't it okay so let's see if that works book value of the assets giving up was 60,000 wasn't it and then the book value that was for the truck the book value of the cash was how much 10,000 and then we said what plus the gain and the gain was 30,000 that will always give you that number and it's important to know how to calculate because I might give you a problem which all I ask you is what is the value of the new asset right it's a hundred thousand I mean, look we knew it was a hundred thousand there's nothing to argue with we know it's a hundred thousand isn't it or this journal entry won't balance and we know we got to take the old equipment off. We got to take off the accumulated depreciation. We got to recognize the gain. We got to credit cash for ten thousand, don't we? Okay. So if you want to sit there and do a whole journal entry to plug the number to make yourself feel happy, go ahead. But I'm just simply telling you that you will always get that right number by taking the book value of the asset surrendered, which was the book value of the truck, the book value of the cash, add the gain that will give you, or subtract the loss if there was a loss. That'll give you the value of the new asset. I don't know yes. if you can tell us. Are you gonna, is it going to be a multiple step thing where you ask for different I could give you that whole fact pattern and ask you for the journal entry for either company here. Where did I chair, choose the 90000 yeah. Because they were asking me for Feld. First of all, where did you say I used the 90,000? Up here? Because I'm calculating the fair value of the truck. 
that Feld owned. They said, what is the gain recognized by Feld? The delivery truck had an original cost of 140,000, accumulated depreciation of 80,000, and an estimated fair value of 90,000. I don't know what else you want me to tell you. I don't care about the next sentence. <laughs> the delivery truck, which Feld has the delivery truck, had an original cost of 140, accumulated depreciation of 80, and an estimated fair value of 90. I don't need to read any further. To determine that ninety thousand is the fair value, right? Well, don't, don't explain anything. No, there's no more explanation needed. The delivery truck had an original cost of one forty, accumulated depreciation of eighty, and a fair value of ninety thousand. That's reading comprehension, guys. That has nothing to do with accounting. So the fair value is 90000 isn't it? Right? Okay. There it is. Book value is 60 The gain is 30 Okay. Question? Okay, good. Let's look at this next one now. Uh, which of the following statements correctly describes the proper accounting for a non-monetary transaction that are deemed to have commercial substance? Will we defer anything? We recognize gains and losses are always recognized on everything, aren't they? Okay, good. Let's take a look at this um, Campbell truck now and um, they want to know what amount is the new book value for the truck that Campbell received and it's going to be what it's going to be book value of any assets given up plus the gain okay you see why I don't want you to get into the thing of doing a plug otherwise you'd have to do a whole journal entry to answer this meanwhile you don't have all day to answer these questions right Okay, so let's just take a look. I have what? I have a Campbell Exchange delivery truck with Highway Inc. Campbell's truck originally cost 2300 So, okay, not OG, which is original gangster. Original cost equals 23000 One time somebody said, oh, John's one of the old Gs that did, OGs that did this and that, and I thought, they said I was an old G. I was like, why are you calling me old? No, original gangster. Okay, 23000 Oh, okay, that's okay. Its accumulated depreciation was what? 20000 So what do we got? A uh, book value here of what? Book value of 3000 And it has a fair value of what? Five. Can we calculate the gain? Okay, so the gain is what? The gain, the transaction has commercial substance, so we're okay with the gain. The gain is three is uh, five thousand minus what? Three thousand, meaning I have a two thousand dollar potential gain here. Oh, thank you. Okay. It lacks commercial substance. Okay, good. Thank you. So since it lacks commercial substance, what's going to happen? I'm going to sit here and I'm going to do what? I'm going to take the gain to the extent that the boot constitutes what? The amount of cash constitutes um, more than 25%. Okay, and since I'm the person what? This is Campbell, and Campbell is going to pay cash or receive cash? They're going to pay cash, so they're going to only take gain here if it's more than 25%, right? Okay, so to get the, to see um, whether or not I will take this gain of 2000 I'm going to have to sit here and do what? I'm going to have to sit here and look at the, t the amount of cash that's being received, which is what? 700 divided by the total consideration received, which is the 700 plus what? Plus the 5,000, which is the 
uh, value of the item that's being received here for them. For them. Okay. So um, where am I now? Where did I get the 5,000? 5, 5,000 is the fair value of the item that's being received. So 5,000 versus um, not what's being received, but what they're paying. They're paying cash, right? And they're giving up a truck that has a fair value. So the 700 divided by 700 plus 5,000 gives me 700 divided by 5,700, which comes out to roughly 12.2%. So will the person paying, will the company paying the boot recognize any of that 2,000 gain? The person paying the boot does not recognize the gain unless it what constitutes more than 25%. Okay, so when I go ahead and I prepare the journal entry now for this, I'm going to go ahead and take what? I'm going to um, look at the, um, for the uh, amount, book value of the new truck, I'm going to take what? The book value of the assets surrendered, which was 3000 right, for the truck. Plus the book value of what? Of the uh, cash, which was 700. So that means the new truck, which is what this was asking, is 3,700. Because I don't take any of that gain, right? So the answer to this question is 3,700. Okay. And so now I go ahead and I can prepare that journal entry pretty easily, which is to do what? I thought I put down the journal entry for it. Um, but I should be able to do it pretty easily now, which is uh, the new truck is 3700 Right? I have to go ahead and do what? Debit the accumulated depreciation for, and the accumulated depreciation on it was 20000 And then I have to credit the original cost for the truck, the asset, which was 23000 And, of course, I have to do what? I have to credit the cash for 700 to prepare the journal entry, and that's for the company that, uh, what is company is this, Campbell? This is Campbell. Okay. Now, uh, just for kicks, what I did was I said, okay, well, what's the journal entry then for highway? Okay, because highway is going to bring in that new truck, right? So the value of the new truck now for a highway is going to be the book value of the assets that were given up. And so the book value of the um, old truck was, what is it, 20, how much did they pay for it? <laughs> highway paid how much? 23.5. Okay, they paid 23.5, and the accumulated depreciation is 19.9. Okay, so they paid 23.5, and the accumulated depreciation was what? 19.9. 19.9. Nine. So we've got a gain here of how much? 2,100 is the game. Okay, you guys are getting ready to go, so we're done with this question because I don't want to try to figure it out. Huh? I mean, it's the book value. Thank you. The book value is what? 3,600? Book value is 3,600, and we're sitting here, and we have what? The book value 
versus the um, 5,700 fair market value. 5,700 minus 3,600 means there's a total potential gain here of 2,100, of which we're going to take what? Here we take the 12.2% because what? We're the person receiving the boot, right? And so that gives me a gain that I will recognize of 256. Okay? So now you go ahead, and if you're trying to prepare that journal entry, and I'm kind of running out of space on this thing. I'll just write it down here. If you're trying to prepare that journal entry, you're going to go ahead and do what? Credit the truck for 23.5. Debit the accumulated depreciation for 19.9 get that off the books you're going to go ahead and debit the cash for what 700 because they're getting cash you're going to credit the gain and you're going to credit the gain for the 256 right because we are going to take that portion of the gain and then the new truck and you know they call it a plug which is this they're showing you for the other company for Campbell but for the new truck you don't have to plug it you simply give the book value of the assets given up which was what the old uh, truck book value of old truck and book value of old truck is uh, 3600 okay and then what you have to do is look at it a little bit differently with the cash instead of doing what instead of adding the cash you need to subtract the cash of 700 okay and then what plus the gain that's going to give me what uh, when I subtract the cash that gives me 2900 and then I have to do what add the gain that was recognized and the gain that was recognized was 256 that gives me 3156 that I will bring in the new truck for. So, new truck is going to be 3156. Okay. Okay. So, that shows you the journal entry from both sides of it, right? In this transaction, both the one that they asked about and the other company um, again even though this is telling you to do a plug for it if I give you a multiple choice question where I'm just asking you what's the new truck you go through it the book value of the assets surrendered plus any gain right okay guys I will see you on what's today Monday I'll see you on Wednesday you want me to save this okay huh yeah, okay yes sir yeah we'll get them both thank you Make sure you signed in, please. Hi. Okay. I still have to do that. I haven't done that yet. Okay, but yeah, whenever you're ready. Uh, come next time, I'll have it for you, okay? In Canvas, there was an announcement up there some time ago that gave you the username and password. Okay, thank you. Yeah, uh huh. Yeah, okay.